Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Bryce. And this is the Earn and Invest podcast. In describing how people deal with grief, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross documented five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and hopefully one day, acceptance. While not always taken in exact order, these steps plot a way forward and evolution to deal with difficult things. Well, clearly not all difficult things are bad, and sometimes positive changes in our life causes not only celebration of all that is new and joyful, but also grief, yes, grief, in what has been lost. Early retirement, it seems, may be one of those difficult things. And according to a recent blog post by two of my favorite bloggers, it also causes many to traverse a series of stages. In fact, their discussion centers around a TEDx talk from 73-year-old Riley E. Moines, a retiree and author who succinctly broke down the four stages of the mental journey that retirees go through when they are no longer defined by work. Let's take a listen. Everyone says you have to get ready to retire financially. And of course you do. But what they don't tell you is that you also have to get ready psychologically. Who knew? But it's important for a couple of reasons. First, 10,000 North Americans will retire today and every day for the next 10 to 15 years. This is a retirement tsunami. And when these folks come crashing onto the beach, a lot of them are going to feel like fish out of water without a clue as to what to expect. Secondly, it's important because there is a very good chance that you will live one-third of your life in retirement. So it's important that you have a heads up to the fact that there will be significant psychological changes and challenges that come with it. Bryce and Christie are the powerhouse couple who created the blog Millennial Revolution. They are the authors of Quit Like a Millionaire and are considered some of Canada's youngest early retirees. Bryce and Christie, welcome back to Earn and Invest. Bryce, I want to start with you. How much do you think you both have changed since retiring? You know what I love about you, Jordan? You're the master of segues. That was really well. <laughs> okay, so Christy, why don't you start? We're going to have a little space. I think some expectations are what we expected in retirement is a little different from like what actually happened. One of the things that I wasn't expecting was the fact that I thought like, okay, the friends that you make at work, like you're just going to be friends with them forever. And after you you retire, you're going to come back and tell them about, you know, all your exciting adventures from retirement. And and then you're just going to like bond over that. And no, 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 that's not really what happens. What happens is in the first couple years of retirement, like they're still coming back because we were traveling, we would come back and then we would visit our old coworkers, ex-colleagues, and then kind of like ask how they've been doing. And it is kind of weird. You kind of feel like everybody else, like nothing has changed, but then for you, you've lived multiple lifetimes. So it's like kind of like you're you're saying like, oh, and then I went to Thailand and then I went to the UK and then I went there. And then for them, it's like, like they're like, I bought a new couch. And you're like, yay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> so, yeah. So then over time, you end up having less and less in common because the things that used to bond you, which was like griping about, you know, working over time or like a terrible boss or like congratulating each other on getting a promotion, none of that stuff is relevant anymore. I yep. think you had the same experience, right? When you hung up with some of your coworkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, it just becomes less, like it's kind of like when, how you, you know, I don't want to put words in people's mouths because a lot of people still remain good friends with their uh, people from high school and this kind of stuff. But like, as like, you know, to think about like when you move from like grade school to high school or middle school, middle school to high school, high school to to, to college and university, your your life circumstances changes, your shared experiences changes. And as a result, you, you just seem to have less in common with the people that you, you know, shared all these experiences with in your previous you know, life. I was surprised, I guess, that it, the change, what the like the changes to your like psyche and to your social circles and just all the stuff that happens after retirement, even like years afterwards, that it was that fire actually is not the end of the journey. It's actually the beginning of a much larger journey, which is what, how, like, how do you adapt to this new post fire reality? 
what is your new identity? And we're going to get in, I know we're going to get into that idea that I, of what identity even means and how it changes and with all this kind of stuff. But it is like it is a new life that you're entering now. And it's the changes can be quite dramatic. And for people who are not expecting that, it can be also quite a, a, an unpleasant traumatic, shock, <laughs> an unpleasant shock if they don't prepare for that yeah. properly. If they don't go out and, for example, come to these conferences and meet the and then and talk to other people in the fire community and try to meet people that are kind of on a similar life path that they lose, they, they kind of lose touch with people that they used to be quite close with. But if you don't add new people to your to, to your life, it can be quite lonely. And what we realize is it is a journey afterwards. And there are actually like stages to it. And that was what was so fascinating about hearing this guy talk at this TED talk. This guy was just talking about what's his name again? Moines. Riley Moines. Yeah. Right, Riley Moines. And he's talking about regular retirement, right? The guy's in the 70s. And, and he's just and he's talking about like what the experience was like after he left work. But the the struggles and the stages that he talked about are actually quite relevant for people who retire in their 30s or 40s. It just comes in a different form because you have a lot more options when you're in your 30s and 40s that people in their 70s don't. Christy, Bryce was just talking about the stages after retirement, and you guys also use the term traumatic. I want to quote you from this blog post, Christy. You said, the evening after I officially gave my notice, I started feeling this weird tightness in my chest and it was getting hard to breathe. I waited and I tried to ignore it, thinking it would just go away, but it didn't. Why such an immediate and sudden change? What was going on with you? Yeah, I think part of it was the expectations versus reality. Because when you spend all this time getting towards financial independence, the expectation is that when you actually give your notice, it's going to be the happiest day of your life. And specifically in my situation, because I did not like my job. And so I was just having all these dreams of me like dancing out of the office, giving my notice, (laughs) giving my finger to my boss, and it's going to be happily ever after. And sometimes you don't realize it, but your body reacts differently from what your mind is thinking, which is exactly what happened at that time. And my body went into a little bit of a panic attack, which is not something that I was expecting. And um, and a big part of that was the losing your identity piece. So even though the identity didn't fit me that well, like as an engineer, I, I, I had had that ent- that identity for 14 years, because including going to university and working for almost 10 years, it's very difficult to just turn a switch. And even if it's not an identity that fits you very well, it's that familiarity, that that dogma. It's like it's been built inside me for so long that how do I all of a sudden flip that switch from engineer to traveler or to writer? It, it There's definitely kind of a messes with your head and it takes some time to process that. And I did not expect that I would need time to process it. I just thought I was just going to go from like unhappy to happy and then happily ever after. Bryce, one of the things I love about reading Millennial Revolution, especially when you do case studies, is we always get to a point where people are writing in, describing their situation, and your guy's reply is, it's time to math shit up. (laughs) So let's talk about that a little bit. Right now, you're talking about things like identity and purpose. You can't just math math that kind of shit up. I mean, was that expected? Like, did you feel like when you began this journey that, oh, the math is going to prove things that are all okay and they're fine and and that's going to be all the comfort I need? Yeah, I mean, like honestly, I I did think that that was like as long as the spreadsheet, like little little <laughs> cell is green instead of yellow or whatever my conditional format is formula is, that that should be good enough for all happiness. It turns out there are some things that math has difficulty quantifying, like like identity, for example, and it's kind of most of the fire blogs out there are mostly focused on the accumulation phase and just the math part of it. Like, how do you get to FI? Because that's where the audience is. The the amount of people that are like post-fire retirement and trying to figure out their identity is like, you know, a couple dozen people, right? I mean, like, it's not, it's, you're not going to, you're not going to find an audience if you write to that. But so the demand of the audience is much more on the math side because there's like, because most of the people that are reading the blogs are still trying to figure out how do 401ks work? How do I, how do I get money out? How do I get, how do I tax optimize it? And all that kind of stuff, which is all very, very important and all great. What was surprising to me though, is that after the, after I left, after we left, the math just kept getting easier and easier and easier, like managing the portfolio as you leave your, as you leave your job and 
after the first couple of years where you're kind of worried about sequence of return risk and these kinds of issues, after it, after a few years in which you properly manage that risk and then your portfolio really does start just growing on its own, the, the math, the actual financial manage of it becomes pretty trivial. Like it, it really just took me, it really just takes me a couple of days a year for me to just manage it. And at that point, I don't really need to worry about it anymore. Which then, which then these 360 days of the rest of the year to do you know, <laughs> something else. And then that's the really big question is like, okay, what I'm already doing math. I'm still doing math right now. So it's like, so what do you do with the rest of the 360 days of, of the year? And that's the big question that, that was actually quite surprising to me and to both of us that we really needed to actually sit down and strategically think out, okay, we figured out how to get, how to exit the life or that we had before. But now we need to actually fill that void. What do we build instead? And it's really, really important, as a, especially as a couple, that for us, that whatever vision that we had for that, we needed to build it together, right? Because it's like, it is possible for people to make decisions in retirement and then start to drift apart, right? Like I have one, like, you know, if I had, for example, decided to say, like, you know, I'm a computer nerd. We're both engineers, but I was, I was, I was a nerd that was like, you know, like coding for fun on like on like summer summer vacation and that kind of stuff. And Christy is absolutely not that kind of person. So there was at the very beginning, an example of this is at the beginning of our retirement, I got really into software development because I figured, okay, I'm going to I'm going to write an app and I'm going to be and I'm going to make it really famous and then I'm going to do and I'm going to try to like sell it and like do this like startup y kind of thing. And what I realized because that's just that's just my instinct to, you know, find a problem and then write an app for it. Mm-hmm. But Christy had, I, what I realized very quickly on is that Christy had no interest in doing any more software development outside, like after leaving, after leaving her, her job, which, cause she really didn't like it. She wanted to, she wanted to be an author and she wanted to write, you know, fiction. So that was one of the first things that I realized, oh, this is a little trickier and a little less straightforward than I thought it would be. Because if I realized that if I kept going down my path and, and if she kept doing, going down her path, we're both retired, but we're not really spending much time together because we're both working on different things. So it really is like, like, what is that identity? And for us specifically as a couple, what is that shared identity that we want to build? And how do we go about doing that? And that was actually a big, the big challenge for us, like over the first, you know, couple years of retirement. Chrissy, this fascinates me and I've never thought about it this way before, but in a sense, when you're retiring together early or not as a couple, you're walking away from something that often is your particular individual identity, and you're stepping into something which may be a couple's identity, unless you're very circumspect about how you separate your time. Did you foresee this as an issue? Because this is the first time I've heard anyone ever kind of talk about it this way. Yeah, it's quite interesting because on one hand, you're thinking like, okay, there's two of you. So the loneliness factor, you don't have to worry about it as much if you're retiring as a single person. But on the other hand, like Bryce was saying, if you go in opposite directions, like where does that lead you, right? Like a lot of people, when they have their separate identities from work, it actually does fill up the time. Like you're both going to work. You don't really have to have projects that you work on together. We actually did write a children's book on top of our full time jobs, but not everybody does that. And then now you're spending all your time with your significant other, and you don't actually know if you're going to be able to work together on a project. And are you going to go off and and do your own projects? And how's that going to work if you are not physically at a nine to five job? So those are those are actually things that you don't expect until after you retire. And you don't really know how that's going to work out until you're in the thick of it. Yeah. Remember at Chautauqua when sometimes people will go, oh, it's so great that you can travel together. I could never spend 24 hours with my husband and <laughs> wife and this kind of stuff. And I kind of make a joke about it at the time. And and and, and it's just like, well, that's because I married the best one. But, <laughs> <laughs> so full of crap. So full of crap. <laughs> uh, that kind of comes from like that kind of worry. And you know how like some people like they work together, they're great business partners, they go home, they're great par- co-parents together, but they like can't travel together and they can't really like spend a lot of time together because they don't have that many like hot, like things to do together and that kind of stuff. And then they just start fighting or getting each other's nerves and this kind of stuff. All of that comes to be, all of that comes to the forefront when you basically eliminate the work because in, in a certain way, both of you having jobs that are presumably with different companies, you're spending most of your day apart, means you don't have to kind of deal with these issues. But when you take away that that crutch, you really just kind of have to go, okay, what like what do we have in common together? And that's the part that 
can be quite frustrating and a little bit scary because, you know, what if you can't figure out what that is, right? But uh, what I realized over time is if you want to figure out what that is, you will eventually, like, you will eventually find it, right? Like, it, the the trick is to try different things and then just seeing what fits. But if you sit there and then kind of go, well, this isn't going to work, you know, why bother trying and that kind of thing? Like, you just don't know what you don't know. And what retirement does is it gives you the time and the space to figure that out. But building that shared identity with your spouse or significant other or whatever is actually really like if you can pull it off then retirement is just awesome because what you end up doing is what ends up happening and what our life is like now is we get to spend all of our time together with your best friend and also this and and also you know we're, we're doing the blog together we're doing the book together we're doing all this kind of stuff so when we have a shared success which which would just happened just now because we just finished a project right before we hopped on this call it was like yeah we did it high five and it's just it, it, it's just a lot of a lot of fun all around but if you don't figure that out then yeah you can you know you can get in the situation where you find out that yeah you don't really have that much in common so that's that, that is something that sk- does scare some people but if you work on it and if you both of you want to build that shared vision together my experience is you will eventually find something you eventually build something that works but you have to try Chrissy, this brings me back to the introduction. It surprises no one that things like grief is stressful. And so we need these stages to get past it, to get to acceptance and to deal with it. But I guess we're also discussing today this idea that positive things in your life, too, can also cause stress. And maybe sometimes we're not necessarily prepared for the positive steps we take to make our lives better. Tell me about how you came across Riley Moyne's and had you ever seen anything like his stages before when talking about retirement? Yeah, I think it was just recommended to me in one of these, like, you know, Google is like recommending you articles because you're looking up stuff like for digital nomadicism or like early retirement. It's like, maybe you'd like to read this article or whatever. And then I I went there out and when I watched his TED talk, I was like, even though this is for regular retirement, it's not for early retirement, it's actually very relevant. And I wasn't expecting that because I was thinking, well, if you're retiring early, you have more, you have like, you have the energy and you have more time and you can do a lot of things that is more difficult when you're in your 70s, which is his age when he retired. But a lot of the psychological aspects of retirement is is pretty much identical. And it also opened up my eyes in like taking that and then comparing it to my early retirement journey and seeing that it doesn't actually the stages that he describes the four different stages, the, you know, you start off in like permanent vacation. And then the second stage, you go into boredom and depression. And then the third stage, you go into experimentation. And then the final one is reinvention. Even though it seems like it's very like sequential one after another, it doesn't have to be like that. And looking at my own journey, it was definitely not sequential. Because in our case, we actually started experimentation before I even left my job, because I would consider that starting the children's book on the side which probably wasn't good for my health because it's having a full-time job and another kind of <laughs> second job on top of that. But that did give me feeling. So even though I had that panic attack after I gave my notice, it wasn't as long as I thought it would be to kind of come back to like, okay, what am I going to do in a retirement? Let's, this is my second life. I'm starting my second life. What are some of the things like I had that background of knowing how to get like I basically went from the top of one ladder to the bottom of a brand new ladder and having to start over. And I knew how to do that from learning how to write while I was working. So not having all the stages in sequential order, I found was actually quite helpful to us. But I think what's common to everyone, regardless of how the stages happen to you, even if it's not sequential, is that everybody needs some time to process the loss of their their identity. And that time might differ depending on your personality, depending on what your identity was, how long you've had that identity, because society has conditioned us into thinking that we are our jobs. And and it's really hard to get out of that mindset, because the first thing anybody asks you at a dinner party is, what is it that you do? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not who you are. It's not what do you like. It's, it's not what do you want to do, where you've traveled to. It is who, what is it that you do, right? So it, to get out of that mindset and to just let go of that ego is a whole process. And we shouldn't try to rush it. We should really just give it the time that it needs to process the the changing of the identity and the letting go of the ego. Yeah. What was really interesting for me was that how much, how much the parallels between that and the stages of grief, which 
I'm sure you're very you're very familiar with because of your job. We became intimately familiar with it because you know after my uh, you know. God, it must have been like two, three years ago when we first found out my dad's brain cancer diagnosis, like going through that entire grieving process myself with a really devastating diagnosis like that. And then also, but also seeing it, how my sisters and my my mom were all kind of processing it differently at different speeds and in different order. So similar to that one, the the stages of of, of this one, because if you think about it, retirement is, we, we market it as rainbows and unicorns and sunshine which it totally is, but it's also, there, there is also quite some similarities to with the grief part of it because you are letting go of, of your old life. So for us, it was like, instead of going one, two, three, four, which is, you know, the euphoria honeymoon phase, and then the panic, then the experimentation, and then the new, you know, rebirth, you know, rising from the ashes, like a phoenix <laughs> kind of thing. For us, it was like, it was experimentation first, then panic. <laughs> Then honeymoon, and then go directly from that into into rebirth. So mm-hmm. we we experience it in a different order, but that but we still experience all of those stages in you know like you know in some form. Christy, we're gonna just for the sake of this conversation here talk about the numerical order, but it's very clear that in fact, just again like the stages of grief, we don't necessarily go through these things in the numerical order. So this is Riley Moyne's four stages of retirement. The first one is permanent vacation. I'm thinking about reading your blog over the last bunch of years, Christy. And in some ways, it reads like you're still in permanent vacation. I mean, you guys do lots of travel, et cetera. Are you still partially in that stage? And if not, when do you think you got through that stage? Interesting. I think it's a different version from when we first started traveling, because when we first started traveling, like that was the first time I ever could spend an entire month without having to think about work. Like when you go on vacation, you don't quite let go of the stress of work because you're always thinking about, okay, when I get back, I have to do all those things. So that permanent vacation, the first time that you get a taste of that freedom without having to think about all the baggage later on of like your identity and all that stuff. It is just like the best feeling in the world at that time. Like I think my first experience going to the UK, I saw a wheat field and I was enamored with a wheat field. And yeah, I had like, I had Bryce take a picture of me like jumping for joy in the air. And, and I'm like, like just standing in a wheat field. You're like, wow, this is amazing. It was like, right, it was like right next to Heathrow Airport. Airport, 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 Airport and then yeah. she's and then I'm like, why am I taking a picture of this? Like there's <laughs> so much we, like we just got here i mean like you need to raise your standards a little bit because like you know like yeah. there's other stuff to want to see yeah. here um and now i'm like a total travel star and i'm like oh barcelona that's so basic yeah anyway. oh so, yeah but yeah so th- that that part of it it's like now with with the permanent vacation stuff because we have continued to travel it's as and we've tried kind of just integrated into our normal lives it kind of just feels like we're switchblading between num- stages one and four, the permanent vacation and 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 the like, you know, the reborn identity. Mm-hmm. And we just we're, we're kind of existing in kind of like a combination of the, those two stages, which is which is I got to admit, pretty dope. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I do think it's a, a, like now you don't so much travel to like check off the bucket list because you've already been to those places. You've already done all those all those things. It's now more like traveling to see friends and traveling to meet the community that the new community that you have built in retirement. So that does kind of give it a different feel than yeah. the original, like I've never seen a wheat field. This is the best thing ever. Yeah. Bryce, I feel like stage one permanent vacation is kind of that hedonism, right? What we yeah. dream of sitting around in your underwear, maybe playing video games. For some people, it's travel. For other people, it may be alcohol or drugs or sports or who knows, whatever really sure. doesn't necessarily need a purpose other than it brings them joy. Why does that eventually get old, Bryce? Like, why can't we just stay there forever? I'm still there now, man. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> there, I, I have a friend of mine who, 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 um, uh, he's 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 actually my um, an old coworker, and 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 I and and he's just going like he was also wanting to do this like FI thing, and then I was talking to him at over like you know drinks and this kind of stuff. Like, what do you what is your vision for for the for the first year of, of retirement? And he goes, I've always wanted to be a pothead. <laughs> and I went, okay, I wasn't expecting that, right? And then he laid out his very, very well-reasoned bulleted pointed list of why this is a good idea for him. And I'm like, dude, you don't need to justify anything. You want to, if, if, if you want to be the next, if you, if you want to be the biggest stoner on your block, you go right for it. Like it's legal here in Canada, legal here in Canada now. So just, you know, just, just do whatever you want. But just with like, with anything else, hedonism and consumption for the sake of hedonism and consumption 
does get old simply because, you know, you get used to anything, right? I mean, the, the, how we travel. So moving it away from drugs a little bit, because we're supposed to be a family-friendly podcast here. When you travel, how we traveled for the first year is very different from how we traveled now. So on a typical, like, God, okay, remember that itinerary of our first oh year God, traveling yeah. around Europe in which we were hitting... It's like, like every two days. We every two or three days we were changing cities. Yeah. Because we wanted to, we, we're, like, we're like, never going to see this again. We have to jam as many cities in there as possible. Yeah, we were like in vacation mode. Like we were <laughs> kind of like, oh, we're backpacking. Like you know, we're backpack. We're those annoying millennial backpackers that are are traveling around Europe. So we have to hit as many cities as we can. We have to see all the churches. We have to see all the That's the travel scarcity mindset. Yeah, exactly. And now when we hit up a new city, we, we first of all our, our traveling has gotten a lot slower. So we typically now fly into a city and then we're there for you know like at least a month kind of thing, right? So it's it's and and we're a lot less touristy as well. Like we we will do a couple touristy things like oh what's interesting here and we'll go go see that kind of stuff. But we integrate kind of the city into our normal living in a way that's you know for example we'll like we'll work on the blog we'll write an article and for like a day and then we'll go out and do some touristy thing the next day and then we'll do some social stuff the next day and then we'll go back and then do some more work that that day. So you have to figure out what your rhythm is, but it's like the first part of that traveling, I call it like consumptive travel. Mm-hmm. It's just, you're just kind of going, I'm, 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 I want all the travel that I can. You're a kid in a candy store that's given like a, a credit that's given an infinitely rechargeable credit card. So what does that kid do? He eats all the damn cake and the cookies and until he gets sick. Right. And then afterwards, you go, okay, I've had enough of that. And also, I just had my stomach pumped. Maybe that wasn't such a good idea. (laughs) And then you kind of like figure out how to do it sustainably. So now when we travel, I like to call it more productive travel. We travel to places which are have good, like, you know, which are good for like digital nomads, like have digital nomad communities there. We go to we, we travel to places where there are fire communities that we can meet up with. We travel to places where there's conferences that we can maybe attend or speak at, depending on what type of conference it is. And uh, we travel to find new places to write about. Like we just like, so, you know, just coming back from Colombia and Peru, like those are going to turn into travel posts, right? And then those are going to, and so it's now more of like a, we travel to, we, we travel in service of the identity that we have rather than just travel for the sake of traveling you know, so it, it, it is a subtle shift, but it's actually kind of, it, it is quite important. I love how you put that because you're making your point here again, you've taken stage one permanent vacation and actually re- brought into it this whole idea of stage four, which is reinvention, which is you now do it for connections and purpose and identity, kind of that stage four reinventing yourself and building a fuller life. And yet you're using some of the pieces of that permanent vacation feel I want to move Christy to something a little more grim. If one is permanent vacation, which at least in the beginning sounds pretty cool. Stage two is boredom and depression. And Moines calls this the plunge into the abyss of insignificance. Um, I love that guy. He's got a, he has a flair <laughs> for melodrama that I appreciate. How long did it take you to start feeling some of this? I mean, it sounds like Christy, you felt a little bit of this, right? that first day when you walked away from your job? Yeah, I don't think I ever felt bored, but I did feel that loss of identity, the loss of ego. I think that's a really big part of it. And a lot of our society is built on chasing ego, right? Like I'm important. Look at my job title. Look how much money I'm earning. So even if you have enough to live on because of your portfolio, but you don't have that like, you know, that title that you could like show off to other people, And I think a lot of this also comes from working in North America, because what happened after we traveled, I because I thought that living in that bubble, like being in North America, it's like, of course, the rest of the world is just like us. And they all want to be like us, like everyone's like this. No, after we went to Europe, we discovered that that is not like it's not like that in the rest of the world. And when you go to Europe, they're more their mentality is more like life is meant to be lived. And life is not always about hustle and bustle and showing off your status. Specifically, particularly in like Denmark and the Scandinavian countries, it, it, you, if you actually show off, people really do not like that. Like they want to put you down uh, a, a notch because it's like we're all equal. You're not better than anyone else. Just because you have a fancy title does not make you special. Just because you have a higher salary does not make you special. So just having to like have that mind shift of letting go of the ego and letting go of the importance and letting go of that competitive spirit that comes from North America, where you 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 got to just like climb the corporate ladder and show everybody that 
you, your value comes from your title. I think that was my biggest struggle, the letting go of the identity, letting go of the ego more so than the, the boredom. It's actually a shift of, it's actually a shift of finding identity. And this is a much bigger topic that I'm sure we're going to talk about some more, but it's a, but it's, it's, it's kind of a shift from deriving your identity from external validation yeah. and then trying to figure out how to derive identity and happiness from internally, right? Like where you don't need other people to, to tell you you're great, to know you're great. And that's really tough. That can be really tough because there's so much of, I mean, we're all like, you know, social media whores on this podcast. Right now. And I mean, like, <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure, Jordan, you've looked at your blog stats and had moments of ex- of happiness and moments of not so happiness, depending on what what Google AdSense was telling you at that time, right? So there was a there was a brief period of time in which I was tracking our blog and all the other like mad scientist and all these like other blogs and then try to figure out like how do I beat his Alexa ranking? God damn it. <laughs> that was the wrong thing to do, man. Oh that was the wrong thing to do. And and that was part of that whole panic process. Is like if I don't know that I like if if I don't have this metric that tells me I'm great, how would I know that? Mm-hmm. And and realizing that was also part of my own stage too of you know dealing with the abyss of insignificance is, is like, maybe it's okay if, if, if you're not, like, maybe it's okay that your blog stats are here or that if you don't have a blog, maybe it's okay that you're not doing like the next big career and the next chasing the next, like, you know, milestone or cookie. What I find is really interesting is that we understand the concept of enough when it comes to finances, right? Like, why did we even become FI and then quit? If we didn't have the concept of enough, just work forever. Just keep building your portfolio, keep raising your salary, never, ever stop. So we realized that there's a stopping point when it comes to finances. And it's like, okay, at this point, it covers all my expenses. Any additional money, there's no point because it's not going to add to my happiness. But we don't understand the concept of enough when it comes to ego. That's the problem. Because we see other people and we're like, oh, but they're getting promotions and I've quit my job and now I don't have that fancy title. And they're getting raises. Like, never mind that you're not even going to spend any of that money if you got the raise anyway, right? But it's just this, this comparison of not being able to have enough because you're deriving happiness externally. But we we can do it with money, but we can't do it with psychology. That that's the thing that I don't understand why we can't do that. We are talking with Bryce and Christy. They are the powerhouse couple who created the blog Millennial Revolution. And we are discussing Riley Moyne's four stages of retirement. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest podcast. Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Bryce and Christy, who are the writers of the blog Millennial Revolution. They are also the authors of Quit Like a Millionaire and are considered some of Canada's youngest early retirees. Christy, I want to go back to something we talked about before the break, this idea of our ego and enough. And I think that really carries us nicely to Riley Moyne's third stage of retirement, which is experimentation. Talk about experimentation in your life. And to me, it sounds like experimentation is almost like the anti-ego, right? Because when we're experimenting, we're almost like saying, I'm not an expert in this. I'm going to go do something that I might be horrible at. And yet that stage three, why is it important? Yeah, so that is the how do you reinvent yourself if you don't try different things, if you don't fail and face plant, because that's how you learn. And in order to do that, you have to really basically overcome that ego problem. I, like I said before, you're going from the top of one ladder. You're, you're the expertise in that field that you've already spent all these years putting towards a skill, putting towards the respect that you're gaining. And you're starting over at the bottom of a new ladder. And but in order to be able to develop a new identity, you have to start at the bottom because you don't know anything yet. If you just continuously like stay at your job just because you're afraid of change, you're afraid of trying new things, then by definition, you'll that's what you'll end up doing for the rest of your life. Yeah. So I think, again, that is something that's going to mess with a lot of people's minds, just getting off that ladder and then starting over and being okay to fail and being okay if your ego gets bruised and then dusting yourself off and then trying over and over again. I think for us, it did help that we started writing and face planting while we were actually working as engineers by having that 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 stage earlier than the permanent vacation. We ended up developing kind of a, a thick skin from that whole process because when you try to write a children's novel, you are constantly inundated with 
fa- like failure and constant re- rejection. I think at one point we were so terrified of our phone because every time it pinged, we knew that it was a rejection from either a literary agent or an editor. And at one point we racked up 200 rejection letters for one of our manuscripts. So that's something that you, regardless of whether you retire or not, whenever you're starting over in a new field and you need to learn those skills, you have to be comfortable with failure and you have to be comfortable with experimentation, which always comes with failure. So when we were uh, trying to get our first manuscript published, the process of actually trying to get it in front of an editor is, you know, there's a lot of stuff you do over email, but there were some times in which there were festivals that you would go to. There's this literary festival called Word on the Street that happens here in Toronto every year. And there are some industry professionals that go to that that set up a booth or, or like a tent where they kind of read your where they page. read your first page and they tell you why you suck, and <laughs> that was very very intimidating, right? We we were actually when we were writing that first book, we were actually doing it with a friend of ours who's also an engineer. He was she was a classmate of ours, and you know top of her field, like for all way intent, smarter than way us, smarter yeah. than us. You know she was like you know number you know like. Basically, like basically a genius, the valedictorian, of the class. you know, valedictorian of every class. That she's, you know, that kind of like, oh, like she gets upset when she gets a ninety nine in 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 a, in a course. She's that kind of person. And at one point, we were just kind of like, oh, that editor or that agent is free. Let's go up there, shove our pages in front of them, and then say, can you read this for me? And then she went, and then she went, no, no, no way. Yeah, she's like, I have to go get groceries. No way, not not. Like, it was because she went. She, it, it was like going from the for her and for us as well, going from the top of one field to basically begging somebody to tell you how do I get better at this other thing was just too big of an ego hit. Was just and and so she didn't do it, and she never actually did get published. But we, but but the fact that we were willing to do that was the big was the big change, and that requires a lot of like. I don't want to say courage, but it does require somebody to be like, okay with acknowledging with those very uncomfortable feelings that, hey, I'm I'm good at this one thing and I'm really not good at this other thing. But that doesn't make me less of a person. Right. You know, like Nobody I am not a like, failure. This is a failure, but I am not a failure. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like that's part of that whole like ego death, like trying to like ra- yeah. grapple with your ego, because everybody that ends up achieving FI was by definition quite successful in their previous career, right? But if you stay with, and if you stay, keep doing that old career, you're never going to retire. And that's always the easiest thing to do. That's always the easiest thing to do. If you're a board certified surgeon, it's the easiest thing to do to get your significance back is just to go back and go back to your old job. But for that person to then go, okay, I'm going to try to learn how to play the harmonica. You know, it's a whole, it's very, it can be quite painful, but it's totally worth it because once you figure out how to do, how to reboot yourself and reinvent yourself like a second or third time, it really makes you kind of go, oh, wow, I like, I, I'm good at lots of different things, or I could potentially be good at a lot of different things. Like, And then you start asking, you know, what can't I do? And that's, and then when you get there, then that becomes, you know, we're skipping a couple stages here, but <laughs> that, that becomes like a re, like that, at that point retirement becomes a like a ton of fun. Chrissy, what happens to the identity during that experimentation phase? Because some of these things are not necessarily identity conserving in the sense that it doesn't always feel good, right? When you're oh, excited yeah. about something, you go out and you're like, oh, I'm actually not good at this. Yeah. You actually have to distinguish between, okay, I'm not good at this, but this is something I actually really want to do. So I will push through until I am good at this. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, I will get there. But there's some things that you try and then you're like, I just really don't want to. <laughs> That's totally okay. You're like, yeah. I'm failing at this and I just do not have the stamina or the passion for this to push through and actually get good at this. And you 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 put those aside. So you have to be able to, you have to give it long enough though. You can't just be like, okay, the first time I have a failure, then I'm not meant to do this. My brain's not wired this way. It, it, you have to give it long enough, but once you have you put in like the effort and you've done it long enough and you're like, I don't think I want to continue with this. I want to try something else. This is not my passion. I'm, I'm not willing to push through all the failure to get t- to be good enough at that. That's totally fine too. You just have to try and see where it goes. Actually, uh, I, I'm going to turn this around a little bit on you, Jordan, because I, I know that uh, we, uh, uh, to our, all the listeners out there, Jordan and the two of us just did a Chautauqua together back in Colombia, back in September. Yeah. And I've, I've seen you kind of develop as a public speaker 
over time. And I know it was very, I know that was a very painful process for you to go from, you know, being a kick-ass doctor and then going to the bottom of being like, how, how, how do I put together a talk? How do I, how do I, like, what was that experience like for you? Because I can't imagine that that was very pleasant. So it's always, I think, really hard to take the thing that you feel best at and decide that that's not the thing that gives you joy. And I think for me, that was the biggest problem. I knew that things like writing and public speaking gave me more joy than being a physician, but I had spent all my formative years learning how to be a quote unquote kick ass physician. Yeah. And so it was hard to then go from that place of ego to say, okay, I'm going to start doing this thing that gives me a lot of joy, but I am nowhere near as good at doing this as I was being a physician. And it was really a mental calculus for me of deciding was that good feeling of knowing you're good at what you do worth doing something you don't like doing versus doing something that makes your heart sing, but not getting positive feedback or screwing it up or being even more imperfect, right? Because I think if you're a driving personality, you feel imperfect at everything, even the things you're really yeah. good at. Yeah. But then to go back to something you're not trained to do, something that maybe wasn't in your wheelhouse before is to say, I'm going to bathe in this imperfection and accept it. The positive part about that is when I got into doing things. So I remember there's something beautiful about being a novice. And I remember when I was even learning medicine, being a novice and seeing things through novice eyes, the first time you make a diagnosis, the first time someone walks in and gives you a series of symptoms and you can connect it into a story that makes sense is actually a really good part of the path. And so I started looking at things like public speaking and saying, look how lucky I am to be a novice again to experience that moment again for the first time when you're up on stage speaking it and, and it's so quiet that you can hear a pin drop. Like you only get to have that happen the first few times where it's completely new. And so I've tried to decide that if I put myself into these uncomfortable situations, I'm going to have more of those moments mm -hmm. and that's worth the pain. And so that's, that's the way awesome. I look. I at love it. that. That's a, that's a really good way of looking at that. And, uh, to all, all the listeners out there, Jordan is a kick-ass public speaker. If Thank you ever you. get a chance to hear this guy talk, people were like crying in the audience. <laughs> and they were like, it changed my life. So all those all those hours of you practicing in the shower <laughs> were totally <laughs> paid off, dude. Good job. <laughs> well, it, it is one of the things I like doing the most, but it took it took a lot of time. We've been talking about your guys' journey through Riley Moyne's four stages. I took a much longer time to do that. In fact, for me, I had to take years to pull away from work so I could start developing those things because I didn't feel that kind of confidence. And it's funny, right? Because that brings us, we've been talking about the three stages, you know, one permanent vacation, two, the depression and boredom, three, experimentation. So we're getting to, you know, the top of the mountain, right? Reinvention. And one of the things I've learned with reinvention is that unlike, for instance, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, where you kind of get to acceptance and the clouds open up and the world is perfect, in this post-retirement life, you're not done once you reinvent yourself. In fact, reinvention is a continuous thing. So I'm wondering, Christy, for you guys, what does reinvention look like? And how often do you kind of feel like you're starting again and reinventing yourself over and over again? I think there was this Saturday morning cartoon that I really love, and it's talking about how it takes seven years to become an expert at something. And the way that they see it is people live multiple lives. And every time they become an expert at something, they get bored, they want to try something new and become an expert at that. So if you go through life learning it and breaking it down in every seven years, you learn to master a new skill, then at the end of your life, you will have lived multiple lifetimes. And I, I kind of see that the same way with reinvention as well, that after, you know, we, we become experts at this writing skill. And it, I think it's, about, it's been like more than seven years now. So I think we're at that point where like, we can try a new skill now, like maybe we'll build a board game, maybe we'll learn to shoot films, maybe we'll do go into YouTube, like whatever it is that we plan to do. At a certain point, you'll want to build another like after your after retirement life then you learn a new skill then it's a, the next skill and then so on and so forth so i i don't see life as this like one big blob of like okay you have this one identity and then you just die with that identity i see it as living multiple lifetimes 
just like travel is like living multiple lifetimes because every single day stretches out because you have so many different activities and you meet so many different people that it makes every day feel like a lifetime. So I see the different skills and reinvention as well as living multiple lifetimes in retirement. So Bryce, critique Riley Moines here. You know lots of people who've gone through probably traditional retirement and early retirement. Do these stages hold up? Yeah, you know what? Like the length of time that people go through each stage does vary. I mean, like I, I, I didn't have it. Like I would describe, I, I described retirement in the past as not quite in this. Like I, I, I love this four stages of retirement and 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 similar to the five stages of grief thing because it it really just kind of puts a button on each like thing as a discrete stage. I just when I was going through it, it was it really was just you know I noticed the. There's that euphoric stage where you just want to, I, I can watch all the Netflix I want today kind of thing, right? <laughs> and then something happens and where that doesn't happen appeal to me anymore. And then after that, everyone just seemed to take different routes, right? Like for us, it was, you know, we went down into the into the writing and then the fire blogging path and other people do like volunteering and they start working, you know, I, we know we know people who became involved in politics or activism and like this kind of stuff. Other people went and became like even busier, you know, like and then and then started a whole new like business, a, a whole new business. And and some people just some people unfortunately do sit there in the depressive phase and they just wallow for a very very long mm-hmm. time. And for a while, I was just so puzzled as to why people have such a different experience depending on the kind of their personality and the choices that they make and this kind of stuff. Why isn't retirement a more universal experience for everyone, right? And that's because the experimentation and the reinvention phase is different for everybody, right? I mean, like the experimentation, the first thing you have to do when you experiment is a you have to you have to need to try new things. You have to have that motivation and that willingness to try new things. And second, you have to have the opportunity to try new things. There's if if you like, I have noticed that people that if they just stay where they are and like physically, like they just stay in the same apartment or the same house that they were before, and then just retire and do nothing. They don't have as many opportunities to try and reinvent themselves and try new different things because they're still surrounded by their old friends, their old family. They're all whining about like, why aren't you still a dentist or like whatever. Mm-hmm. So there are ways to there are ways to make it more likely that you go into these different other stages. But it is absolutely possible to get stuck on a certain stage, and uh, and it like it does happen. And I'm trying to and I guess what was fascinating about this talk is that he also noticed that too. The 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 guy that did the TED talk because he was like not everybody like some people stay in like some people are able to stay in that honeymoon phase for a prolonged period of time some people get into the wallowing phase for a lot a prolonged period of time but it is not a universal journey that everyone actually makes it to the end right of reinvention some people never make it and and that made me kind of go oh gee what are the big differences in that and it really like my kind of five minute take on it is it's kind of like you know motive means an opportunity you know like that kind of uh, that kind of thing you you increase it you have to you do have to put yourself out there and you have to put your you have to give the universe opportunities for you to grow but if you just literally stay in one place there's it's just less likely to happen and then that's kind of where you get stuck i think to continue from that train of thought just from the the friends that i have some of them that retired and some of them went back to work and some of them really enjoy retirement this is a very anecdotal because it's just from my my group of friends and the people i've seen it seems like the difference between the people who have a good retirement and the ones that don't is like having enough of a social network that people give you different ideas for what to do. And sometimes you collaborate with other two people. So you don't feel like you're just drifting by yourself. Society has moved on. Your coworkers are climbing the corporate ladder and you are just in your own bubble, like drifting by yourself, like people who actually feel connected to a new community. And it's not always the fire community. Sometimes it's the digital nomad community. Sometimes it's a community of entrepreneurs, basically a community of unconventional people. Because if you're just connected with the conventional people, but now you're unconventional, but everybody else is conventional, then of course, you're not going to have much in common. And when they're at work, you're just going to be sitting at home twiddling your thumbs with nothing to do. So to me, from the different examples I've seen, it's like the people who actually have that community, unconventional community of people to collaborate with, to feel connected with, they tend to do fare better in retirement. And then there are some people that they they find retirement's not for them and they go back to work and they're happier. That's That's totally fine too. There's also people that go back to work and they're still not happy. So then they realize it's like, okay, it's not retirement that's not making that's making me unhappy. It's me that's making me unhappy. 
Like the unhappiness I'm trying to get is I'm trying to get external validation for happiness rather than internal. Then they they have to work on themselves because regardless of whether you're retired and regardless of whether you're working, you will be unhappy because the problem is in here. It's not out there. And no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to fix it. Well, Christy and Bryce, I wanted to thank you for coming on this show to have this conversation today. I'm reminded of this idea that we often look at retirement as an ending, but actually for many of us, it's a beginning. And just like any new beginning, there's stress involved and there are stages in which we deal with those changes. They may not be numeric and they may not be chronological, but we all go through them. And one thing, especially I'm thinking, Christy, of what you were just talking about, No matter how we end up going through them, we'll always do better when we're surrounded by community, people that support us and can help us through those stages. I want to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you both what is up next in your life and where people can find you. Christy, what's up next? And then Bryce, tell us how we can ask questions and interact with you after this episode. Yeah, so what's up next is speaking of community, we are actually meeting up with a bunch of Chautauquans Sh- and our uh, digital nomad friends in Southeast Asia coming up to uh, escape the winter. So yeah, so we're really looking forward to that. Getting back onto the travel horse. Is that, is, did you get back on a travel <laughs> horse? Anyway, you won't travel with horses anymore. But yeah, getting back to that is uh, is, is a big priority for us because, you know, pandemic kind of sucked and uh, we're, and we're normally like fully nomadic so we're trying to get back to that nomadic life nomadic part of our lives but yeah other than that uh, the best place to find us is obviously our blog millennial-revolution.com and uh, you know we post every monday and about so just check that out we'll, you'll always be able to see you know kind of what we're up to feel free to leave a comment send us a, shoot us a message on uh, just with a contact us form but yeah we're looking forward to seeing everybody out there somewhere in the world yeah let's make awesome stuff happen this has been the Earn and Invest Podcast. And by having myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Christy and Bryce. That's a wrap. Earn and Invest is now part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to this show as well as other fine podcasts. Awesome. As you guys know, I keep things running. Fantastic conversation. I mean, I think this stuff is so, so cool, so interesting. And I think Riley Moynes did us the favor of codifying something that that we've all felt, but maybe didn't have the words for. He had a he did a great job of like listing it up. He's he used to be a doctor, too. Did, did he? Well, well yeah. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a big like I think real like no matter like for the different career paths like how depending on how respected you are and what that career is the more respected and the higher earning you are the bigger the drop is when you go into retirement right because you're like but all these people think i'm a god like who am i now like that's a bigger gap than if you were like you know like if you're like okay i was an artist and now i'm an artist also and it doesn't really matter yeah if if you're yeah it's it's actually pretty rare to hear about people who Failed retirement in terms of like a financial perspective, like ah oh, crap, I I, yeah, I ran out of my I ran out of my, it's, out of my, it's, yeah. it's actually happen. not yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, actually not that common. Happened. It's yeah. actually much more common that I hear about where people kind of go, this isn't for me. I don't like I don't I don't feel like you know I'm, I feel like I'm just constantly depressed and alone all the time and isolated, and then they go back to work, which is totally fine. It's not a failure in terms of like you are a failure. The sad thing is like almost like 99% of those people that said I went back to work, like a year later, you check up with them and they're still not happy. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, but I, like, but I, I, I'm still not happy. It's like I still haven't found yeah. what it is that I'm looking for. The, the Actually, problem. Have, have you ever read that post by Living li, Living yeah. AF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like him, yeah. right? Because he said he went back to work and he's still like, I still don't find joy. I still don't find fulfillment. Yeah. I need to talk to my therapist, right? So that's that whole thing about like, it's not out there, it's in here. Yeah, so, and it's yeah. it's deep, difficult work. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it, right? Like, I think it's maybe the work of our lives is actually to, because we are so programmed that we have to make a living and we spend so much time doing that and it becomes so ingrained in who we are that when you take it away, it feels really uncomfortable to sit in that place, that place of, okay, what the hell else now? What am I, am I really about? I mean, I was in a sense lucky because... 
being a doctor never sat right with me in the first place. (laughs) And I think, you know, if I had been more gratified by it, it would have even been harder to walk away, but it always felt uncomfortable to me. And therefore it was a lot easier to step away. I can't imagine if it had filled me up in any way, shape or form more how I would. I mean, I liked being a doctor and actually it did some amazing things. I'll never say I regret doing it because it did some amazing things for me, but it never sat comfortably. I find it interesting that you're good. You're so good at something that you don't like. Like that's so rare. Usually like I'm not, I'm not good at engineering. I'm just okay at it because I don't like it. But it's like, how do you become like, normally when you're really good at something, you end up liking it or you, you just can't get good at it. Cause you're just like, Oh, I'm just going to half-ass it. Like, how does that work? You know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, it's not that I didn't like it. I think ultimately what I found is that it didn't, fill my soul the way I was hoping it would and that other things did. Oh. So I think I had a good I I I had good habits, techniques and insights that made me a good doctor. Like I like to talk to people similar like I like being a podcast host because think about what I do as a podcast host. My goal is to ask as few questions as possible to get my guests to reveal their truths. Like the life truths, the magic they have inside of them. Well, think about what a doctor does. Actually, what is what is a clinical history? Your goal actually is to say as few words as possible, but goad people into telling you what's really bothering them, what's really on their mind, what their symptoms really are. Mm-hmm. Like the interview techniques, they're not necessarily so different. So well, I have this skill set. Like I'm good at memorizing things. I'm good at seeing patterns and I like to question people and 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 get them to reveal information to me. Like when you put those things together, that makes for a pretty good clinician. Interesting. But I also can use those things to do other stuff. Like ultimately, you know, if in a in a in a different world, I would have loved to be a professional radio host, interviewer, news magazine type person, right? Because this is actually what I truly love doing. Yeah, I can um, tell. But the skills aren't so necessarily different, right? I wonder if you would like being a journalist. I, I wonder. I, I like, so I like kind of more the news magazine journalism. Like I like more the less in-depth research and the more people research. Sure. And I yeah. love that live aspect of, you know, when you get someone behind the mic with you and you're interviewing them, you can prep all you want but you never know what's going to happen. So my prep does give me a series of questions to ask that brings the conversation into a specific like area. But what I'm really trying to do is create a safe environment in which people can then, like I said, it kind of expose their deepest truths and tell their secrets. And so I, I really like that because yes, I like doing research and, and yes, I like that kind of investigative journalism. But to me, it's a whole different realm to actually extract those things from people, from their hearts and their souls, as opposed to finding the answer somewhere on paper. Oh, oh. interesting. You're like a detective of human emotion. Uh, that's what actually that I, I think that's a, a very astute kind of characterization. And I think, you know, a lot of this comes back to, you know, I was young and my dad died and I became very in tune to people and what they were going through and what they were feeling. Again, things you'd say, oh, that really makes for a good doctor. But it makes for like other things too, right? That could be for a very good interviewer, right? That could be for a good coach, right? There are lots of things you can use that for. And I just, I think I start because my father was a doctor and because he died when I was young, because I wanted to be a lot like him. It was easy to take all of that history and those stories and use them to become a doctor. But now as I get older, I'm like, oh, I can use those skill sets and that, that, that sensitivity towards other things. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, you're good at it. You're, you're clearly good at it. And uh, it was it was it was awesome seeing you uh, do the do the uh, do the talk. I mean, you really had that resonant kind of like impact yeah. on the audience that is really hard to quantify. You know? Yeah, I'm still hearing people from Chautauqua talking about like first like the oldest brother and the middle brother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 good job. yeah, that 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 parable, that story that I wrote like four years ago has had a lot of miles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've been able to no use that story. No okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. A lot of miles on that parable. So. Oh, totally. We're still. I mean, like we're still telling like some of the sto- the really cool, like stories that I know play well in media. It's like to 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 new people to interview us. Yeah. You know? So you just know the stories that resonate, and you just get really good at telling them. But uh, I mean, like, what 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 did it feel like the first time you got in front of 
like like the what was the first what was the first uh, conference that you t- you spoke at was it so I've done I mean I've done camp fives I've done tons of camp fives but I was I mean I've been part of speakers bureau for years so I've given talks in many many different places over you know years I can remember maybe one of the first places I really did public speaking is actually when I was a first year medical student I volunteered at the hospice at the local hospice at my medical school oh. And they would try to recruit volunteers. And so I would go and give a little bit of talk, impromptu talk about hospice to a group of 20 or 30 or 50 other students or other people to talk about what hospice is and why should people should volunteer for it. And that that I those are some of my earliest memories of getting up in front of people and just kind of telling stories, right? Because when you're a hospice volunteer, you have all these stories of things you've witnessed in hospice. And so I've given tons of medical talks. I mean, there is, I did, I was asked to come speak in Dublin, Ireland in 2013, which I gave kind of one of my more sentinel doctor's talks about the doctor patient relationship. And that was kind of a big moment for me that I'd really rehearsed a lot for it. And then I stood up in front of an audience and and had a chance to really feel that vibe. I mean, it feels really good for me. It's still scary though. I still get anxious. I still have tons of anxiety about public speaking. I think just like anyone else, but thankfully most of the time, by the time I get up, that goes away and you just kind of feel that sense of I'm doing what I should be doing. Right. Yeah. And that that's, that's obviously the, and it's the same for me with podcasting is like that to me is that moment where you're like, Oh yeah, this is what it feels like. This is what living kind of feels like. So did you go, did you also go through like a, like a honeymoon phase and then like the, the panic and like all that kind of stuff? Cause it, you're like, clearly you've gotten to stage four. So did you get to like one, two or three? You mean with, with, with retirement? Yeah. Reinvention and all that kind of stuff. So I definitely like Christy immediately when I realized I was financially independent, went through kind of that doom and gloom and depression stage. So I kind of started in stage two. I never did much stage one. Like, oh, that's the best part. Have I, you considered pot? <laughs> it's pretty really great. great. So here's what I do is I've tried to take little bits of that and integrate it into my normal life. So for instance, I love to read. So I do frivolous reading and I do it about two hours, three hours a day, every day. Oh, okay. And cool. so that's kind of like, that's part of that permanent vacation is part of my day. I like to exercise and I would do that even though that's a little more work. And so like, I try to do some of that every day. So I have some of that permanent vacation feel, but to me, I don't need vacation, so to speak, as much as if I wake up in the morning and know that I have complete control over how much and what I do that day, that relieves any kind of unhappiness or a lot of stress. Like I can either work my ass off today or I can blow it off and go back to sleep. And ultimately I'm the only one I have to answer to for that. And that to me is like complete luxury. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it looks like you so it looks like you end up actually skipping a few stages. That's great. I, 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 but I mean, and I've definitely done the experiment phase. I mean, podcasting, blogging, all of that, and even writing, that's all been the experiment phase. And I think I'm trying to continuously reinvent, right? So writing the book was a reinvention. I'm thinking about maybe writing a book next about healthcare because I have some very deep held opinions that I've used. I've been speaking about healthcare for years. You guys don't hear it because you're not part of that community, but I've been giving talks about healthcare forever. And I think they could coalesce into a book. So I'm considering reinventing myself as maybe a, a writer outside of personal finance. Um, cool, 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 so, cool. but I think we're always doing that, right? I mean, because otherwise, what would you do with yourself? Like this idea of, like, I guess I was talking to someone about this the other day. Like, people are always like, "Do I want to do this? Do I have enough time to integrate this in my life?" But at least where I am in life right now, and I think you guys might be in the same place. I feel like time is actually kind of abundant. Like, yeah, if I'm worried about time, I just spend it. I stay up an extra hour or two at night. <laughs> I mean, like. I don't know. I feel like there's lots and lots of time and I can't imagine frittering all of that away. Like I want to do some challenging things because I don't know. I feel like that's how I grow and that gives me a deeper sense of fulfillment. Spoken like a true FI person. This is why we can only complain to each other about, oh, there's such an abundance of time. But then we try to talk to our normie friends who actually have. They think we're crazy. They're like, shut the hell up. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, what time? I, I I don't even have time to go to the bathroom. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, and as you get, you know, when you have when you have kids too, like you're very busy when they're really young. But you know, Cameron is 18, Layla's 15, yeah. so they don't really need me. They need me emotionally, but they don't need my physical time the way they right. needed me yeah. before, right? Like Cameron yeah. can drive himself around. He can. So it's like, 
you'd be amazed. And since my wife still works because she's chosen to, she's she feels like there's still some good in doing work. Like that opens up tons of time for me in space. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 